record. Miss Lee Bone, B O A N. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. <laughs> so, just to acquaint yourself with the jury just a little bit, um, how long have you been elected chair of Kershaw County? Oh, I was elected in 2018 and took office January of 2019. And approximately how many deputies do you employ? We've got about 90 personnel all together. All right, and out of the 90 personnel, I've heard about how many of those these years deputies actually? Well, we've got uh, probably 85 are sworn, uh, five are uh, civilian capacity. And can you tell us just generally a quick overview of the educational background? I have, a, uh, I have a master's in public administration and a master's in uh, criminal justice. I attended the uh, 2017 Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI National Academy. All right. And, um, and any specialized training that you, uh, during your years, well, how many years of law enforcement have you had total? I've got, uh, got over 30 years altogether, and I've worked with uh, city, city of Camden. I've worked with county, Kershaw County, of course, and I've, I've worked with SLED. Uh, doing the same thing the uh, special agent earlier was talking about with the uh, Midlands region. And what led you to run for sheriff? Well, I've lived in Kershaw County my whole life, and I felt like that was my calling. And uh, when the opportunity came up where our previous sheriff retired, I threw my name in the, in the pot, and I guess the, uh, I guess the citizens felt to, to give me a shot. Two times, evidently. Yes. So uh, let's talk a little bit. Once you were elected as sheriff, uh, did you come in and kind of uh, try to put together uh, your thought process of what policies and procedures needed to be in place? Yes, yes. It's, we're in a, uh, you know, this is one of those career fields that don't sit still. It's always evolving. Things are changing all the time. So just because I change doesn't mean I'm creating new wheels. We're just always having to build on it. And uh, But yeah, there was philosophy. Uh, mission statement, policy, and all change when I took office. Sure, and, and when you came in, uh, you just mentioned, generally, you talked about uh, mission statement and the policy. You just mentioned those things? Yes. Uh, so I'd like to show you uh, I'd like to show you what's been marked in States 21. Is this, you recognize that? Okay. Yes, that's our mission statement, Sheriff's Office. All right, and is that a mission statement that you uh, brought into effect as you became chair? Yes, day one, this was brought in. All right, I'd like to uh, have this entered into uh, evidence of the mission statement of the Kershaw County Sheriff's Department. 21 without objection. All right. So, sir, what I've done uh, is just take the liberty to get over. I can't see quite as well, so I've uh, blown it up. Did you see from there? Yeah. All right. So uh, let's just talk about what the mission of the uh, Kershaw County Sheriff's Department is. All right, um, it says uh, it is the mission of the Kershaw County Sheriff's Department. Or how about you read it out? Yeah, uh, every time I hire a new employee, this is one of the first things I go over with them when I sit down because just because we went through the process and, and, and decided they're who we want, uh, we want them to know who we are so they can decide we are who they want when they come aboard to us. But this is one of the, uh, the first things I go over with them, and I give them a copy of this whenever I hire them. Uh, it is the mission of the Kershaw County Sheriff's Office to partner with our community to provide quality public safety and public service to all citizens and visitors of Kershaw County. We are dedicated to conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the trust that has been placed upon us. And, uh, and why do you do that, sir? Um, I mean, everybody needs to know the mission of what they're doing, and, and me as an uh, agency leader, uh, I should be willing to tell them that and put it in writing and stand behind it. And um, you said previously that you worked with the Camden Police Department for some period of time? Yes, I've worked with Camden probably over half of my career, like 16, 17 years was with Camden. And was there a uh, similar policy, excuse me, mission statement in place similar to that? 
Uh, we had a mission. It was we had a mission statement. It wasn't. I don't know that it was similar to that, but uh, kind of basics, kind of putting the. Uh, and you want to try to break it down as as you don't want to write a novel on your mission statement. You want to keep it short and sweet to the point. And that's what you do with this, right? Yes. All right. Then you also, um, as you came in and worked, uh, tried to adjust the culture to the way that you wanted it to be as you became sheriff, um, you provided or you came up with a philosophy for the sheriff's department as well. Is that correct? Yes. Take a look at this and uh, tell me if you that if you know what that is. Yeah, th this is the philosophy of the sheriff's office. This is kind of my thoughts on the way things need to be ran, and uh, and again, I put it in writing, so uh, nobody has any question about it. Yes, sir. So I'm going to show uh, publish to the jury on uh, this through a blow up of the actual philosophy. So let's talk generally about what this philosophy is. Uh, so when a person is hired, you said that you go through the mission statement with them so that you know a little bit about you, you know about them, and then you all can make a mutual decision if it's going to be a good fit. Yes. So do you do something similar with the philosophy? Yes, that's part of it. Uh, it's actually, I, I give them a handout, a piece of paper printed. When they w walk in and sit down, I sit it on the desk in front of them. It's got the mission statement. It goes right into our uh, philosophy with the sh agency. And uh, you talk a lot about public trust. Why is that? Yeah, it may, it's very important. You'll see on the philosophy, that's the very first thing that's addressed is public trust uh, on our philosophy. And that's for a reason why it's at the top of the list. Uh, what does public trust mean this year? Um, it, it doesn't so much matter what I think as much as it matters what public's perception is. When you're an elected official and you're working for the public, uh, I've got to not only make sure I'm doing the right thing all the time, I've got to make sure the public knows I'm doing the right thing all the time. It's more important what you guys know than uh, what I may be trying to get accomplished. So as you hire deputies to work for you, um, they are kind of uh, an extension of you? Absolutely, I'm, I'm responsible for every deputy I hire it's never easy process. We keep building on to it as we go along. And um, I always tell my guys that shy of Jesus Christ walking through the front office, I'll never hire a perfect deputy. Uh, but we try to do the best we can. They'll never work for a perfect sheriff. Uh, there's nobody perfect, we're all human. But uh, we try to hire the best of the best. Is there a consequence uh, for violating the public trust in your mind? Absolutely. I mean, you, you, you can't be a part of this agency if you're going to violate public trust. That's, uh, that's huge. And if someone violates that public trust, what do you do to them? Well, we, we part company. We're not going to be working together anymore. Okay. So is that a kind of way part company is in your fire? Yeah, absolutely. It's termination. Yes, sir. All right, so let's look at number two. Uh, what did, let's talk about what that says, what it means. Uh, we must always stand ready to account for actions and not be offended when asked to do so. You know, we're in a profession to where there's a lot of accountability, uh, probably more so than any other. I don't know any other profession that wears body cameras with everything they do and has to be accountable for everything they do, especially the guy you're looking at right now. Everything that I do is, is under the microscope. Um, and in doing that, you know, we, we can't get offended when people ask us because we've got such important jobs that you can't be offended when somebody asks. You should be proud to be accountable for what you've done if you've done the right thing. Let's talk about uh, the third one. Uh, law enforcement uh, officers have the authority. I go they have authority to take away a person's uh, take away a person's freedom, but they never have a right to take away someone's dignity. Um, Tell me yeah. what that means. Well, I mean, part of our job is that when somebody violates the law, we have to take them in custody. We have to arrest them. Um, in a perfect world, nobody would commit crimes. We wouldn't have to arrest anybody. But unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. We do have to arrest people at times, but. Just because you arrest someone uh, doesn't give you the ability. There's nowhere that gives us the, the authority to take away their dignity. A dignity is something that they're going to they're gonna keep with them regardless. Now, the fourth time you talk about law enforcement officers should be fair and consistent in their duties. Can you elaborate on that? <clears throat> yeah. Um, 
Everything you do is going to be fair. One of the examples I use is uh, when I hire somebody, if, if you go to a call with somebody and they're the, the richest, someone you think is the most important person in the county, should you spend X amount of time investigating uh, petty crime that, uh, or that you feel is a petty crime that they're, they're dealing with? And the answer to that is absolutely, as long as you're going to do it for the poorest person in the county who nobody knows and as everybody's going to be treated equally. And after that, um, you ultimately uh, serve the citizens of the community. We should never lower ourselves to the point. Talk about that. Yeah, we should never lower ourselves to the point of taking our frustrations out on a citizen. An officer can never let their personal feelings get involved with doing their duty. And that's tough. That's a tough thing. And most people who don't get into this profession, that's why they say they don't get into it, is because they couldn't have the patience we do. They would want to uh, they would want to hurt people for some of the things they're doing out there. Some of the real bad crimes are out there. So we have to really place that on our guys not to let your personal feelings get involved with doing. Our job's to make the arrests. Our job's not to punish anybody is to, is to make the arrest. Let's talk about the next one about bad decisions. Yeah, this is a pretty simple one here. Most bad decisions are made um, when people are mad and that officers must remember that their brains don't work when they're mad. So we've all been in situations where we get real angry, real mad, and later on when we calm down we realize that we wish we hadn't done what we've done. That's, that's human nature. It's tough to you know, it's tough to overcome human nature, so we always try to remind them of that, that, hey, take a step back, take a deep breath, you know, don't, don't let your anger uh, get involved with your brain. And so I'll move now from the effectiveness metric to, to the next, to the one after that. Uh, law enforcement is only one part of an officer's duty. Yeah, it's only one part of an officer's duty to the community. Officers are in a help-related profession, so they should help people. Uh, there's going to be some things that our deputies do that, uh, you know, some people might think that's that's not law enforcement, that's not police work, but it, what it is. I mean, we're here to help, and uh, this is a help-related profession, so sometimes you will see our deputies doing things that you may not think is law enforcement function. So to that end, uh, when you say that part of what you do is to help people, um, there's a badge that you um, issue to folks. Um, we'll talk about the whole thing. So I'm sure would um, counsel but I intend to have a state number 25. There's a badge that you enter um, after a person is sworn as a deputy uh, to work in your department. Take a look at uh, state 25. Tell me what that is, please. It's, this is our badge we issue to all of our deputies. Okay. <clears throat> and what does that badge say? Well, it's got, <clears throat> inside it's got blessed are the peacemakers, as well as Deputy Sheriff Kershaw County. So for each, Deputy Sheriff of Kershaw County, who become sworn in, they have an opportunity to carry this badge? Yes. And on the front of it, it says, Blessed are the Peacemakers. Yes. <clears throat> now, the next to last one, the officers should uh, not only avoid violating someone's rights. Let's talk about that one, please. Uh, but should stand ready to. Uh to defend everyone's right, protect everyone's rights. All citizens are equally important. Uh, we get a lot of times where, uh, <clears throat> I call it overlapping liberties, where uh, conflict takes place because two people, uh, their rights have extended over one another's rights. And it's our job to kind of get in the middle and, and separate it, uh, and kind of come up with a, with a peaceful resolution. And lastly, let's talk about that last one. Yeah, if you make a mistake, admit it, fix it, and get back to doing your job. I may discipline, but I will never fire a deputy for making an honest mistake. Uh, like I said earlier, we're all human. We're all going to make mistakes. Um, uh, but when you make a mistake, the first step in fixing it is you've got to admit it. You've got to admit you made that mistake. Uh, once you've, you're able to admit you've made a mistake, then you can fix it and get back to doing your job. But that's, uh, that's important. <clears throat> And so, um, as you go over the actual uh, mission statement, you go over the philosophy of the department, um, then once you hire a person, and at that point in time, you have to do something, you have to swear them in. Yes. And that's one of your duties as a constitutional officer, you've got to swear, these, uh, uh, swear folks in who have uh, been hired to join your staff, is that correct? Yes. 
right, so I'm going to show you state exhibit number 23. I've shown this to Council, Your Honor, states 23. Can you tell us what that is? <clears throat> this is the uh, oath of office that uh, each one of our deputies says whenever we swear them in. I'd like to have this entered in evidence, Your Honor. Any objection to 23? Not, Your Honor. 23 admitted without objection. Thank you, Your Honor. And so, as, as we've done so far, twice already, I'm showing you a law of the actual oath. Um, <clears throat> so, do you actually administer this oath to each and every deputy uh, in your department? Yes. Okay. And, uh, and so they raise their hand on the Bible and they have to take this oath that you read to them. Yes. Okay. Yes. And it says, I do solemnly swear or affirm that I'm duly qualified according to the Constitution of this state to exercise the duties of this office to which I've been appointed, and that I will do to the best of my ability to discharge the duties thereof and preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Okay. Yes. Okay, then it goes further. Will you talk about that last section? Now, for, and this is uh, this is by statute here. I didn't I didn't create this. This is a will that we all use at every agency. But I further solemnly swear or affirm that during my term of office as county deputy, I will study the act prescribing my duties, will be alert and vigilant to enforce the criminal laws of the state and protect and <clears throat> and detect and bring to punishment every violator of them. Will conduct myself at all times with due consideration to all persons and will not be influenced in any manner on account of personal bias or prejudice, so help me God. So, um, and again, this is given to every deputy <clears throat> who, you swear to, uh, who comes to work for you, this old. Yes. All right. Um, new consideration to all persons, tell me about that. Well, that, that means you have to kind of weigh out all the, uh, the fact, the importance of uh, whatever it is you're doing and um, this is one that it varies with every situation, but you have to take whatever's important to you and prioritize it and uh, make sure you're, again, being fair to everybody. All right, now, do you know um, former Deputy Jonathan Lewis Goldsmith? Yes. <laughs> Tell us how you uh, know him. We met at Camden, Camden Police Department. He started there. I think that's where he started at, but that's, that's where we first met. We worked together for <coughs> two years there. And, um, and at some point in time, he left and went to a different agency? Yes. Okay. And after you were elected, um, did you reconnect with him at some point in time? Yes, so yes. Let's tell the jury about that. Yes, he, uh, we, I hired him back, I want to say like the first month I was in office. Uh, hired him, well, hired him, I hired him with us at the Kershaw County Sheriff's Office. And um, he swore the oath that we just talked about in uh, States 23? Yes. And he was given this badge, uh, a similar badge to States 25? I, at some point he was. I don't, when we first got there was a different badge that we changed uh, shortly after I got in office. It takes a while to you know, d design the badge, order them, get them in for everybody and switch over. So, and then he was hired the first month. So I'm not sure if he was originally given that badge, but at some point he was, he was given that badge whenever, you know, we give them to all of our deputies. And, and the badge that you redesigned say, bless the peacemakers. Yes, that's our. So at some point he carried that badge. Yes. He was a, uh, as a uh, sworn in officer who worked for your agency, who worked for you. Yes. Right. <clears throat> and his jurisdiction would have been what? Uh, Kershaw County. And what was his role as he came in? He was a patrol deputy. And as you mentioned before, what your practice was, would you have gone through that practice with him about the philosophy, the mission statement? Would you have done that at some point in time with him over time? Yeah, well, again, he was the first month there. I don't know that we had a handout that I gave him at the time I hired on. Uh, from Camden, where we both worked at before, a lot of the stuff you see on our philosophy is, is very similar to Camden's. Um, so he would have been familiar with the, uh, the basics of our, our philosophy. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, why we're here, this uh, Tony Sims matter. Um, a few moments ago, you mentioned that you employ about 85 or so deputies. 
Yes. Do you know every single thing that happens with every deputy every day? No. Are you aware of every single stop that each one of them makes? No. Um, do you have procedures in place so that you can, um, or a chain of, let's talk about your chain of command and how you, uh, how things come across your radar. Yeah, we we know we're living in a world now with body cameras, uh, dash cam, every, there's cameras everywhere these days, uh, cameras in the courtroom. Um, but if you think about, you know, about 70,000 citizens and we answer about 35,000 calls a year, all this, there's probably not enough time in the day for me to review all the video of everything that everybody does. It's, it'd be pretty much impossible for me to do. What, we have, what happens is, is whenever we have a use of force incident, it's required that they do a use of force uh, report to add with it. Um, and that's kind of the uh, current flag as to our use of force board needs to review whatever took place. And then that's what brings it to our attention. So we watch the, uh, watch the videos and, and investigate it. Is there a point in time when you became aware of an incident that took place uh, between uh, um Tony Sims and I, uh, former Deputy Goldsmith? Yes, our uh, training sergeant at the time was the only person who was reviewing uh, use of force incidents, and uh, he brought it to our attention that uh, Goldsmith had been involved with an incident, and um, the, the person that he was, uh, that, that was resisting was not unconscious. And so what did you do at that point? Well, when he told me the location, at the church, I knew that that church had cameras out there because we'd had a recent uh, people robbing grave sites and a lot of churches started putting cameras up and I think that's what triggered that church. But I knew the church had camera system up there so I asked my guys, to, hey, let's, let's get that camera footage uh, so we can get a big picture of what all was going on and, and see everything. Uh, body camera, dash cameras, they're, they're not always gonna show you everything so I wanted to see as much it was that, that was available and um, when did you realize that this matter uh, was something that you needed to uh, be a little bit more vigilant with? Yeah, well, I got a, con I got a call from SLED that they were going to be the ones investigating the case, um, which, is, which is procedure. I don't, we, don't, we always use SLED anytime we're investigating one of our own because, again, it goes back into public trust. I don't expect the public to trust that we're going to investigate our own people for a criminal allegation. So we always contact SLED to come in and, and work it. Um, at that point, we went ahead and just uh, gave everything we had to SLED to include the church video. Um, we, we never, matter of fact, we got a copy from SLED of the church video. We gave everything to them, gave uh, all body camera footage, uh, pretty much everything they, they asked for and everything we thought they may need in the case. We handed everything over to them and some agencies will run what's called a parallel investigation where they'll do an administrative investigation while the criminal investigation is out. We didn't do it in this case here. We just let SLED run the whole uh, investigation. And is there a point in time when you uh, had an opportunity to actually do the body camera and the uh, Abney Church, um, the Abney Baptist Church video? To review it in because its entirety, it? yes. Mm -hmm. yes. All right, and, uh, and as you reviewed it, uh, what did you see? Well, <clears throat> With me, when I look at situations like this, and it also goes whether it's a, a, a crime or, or officer involved in anything, um, I always the first thing I look for is you know, who's where they're supposed to be. It may sound petty, but that's kind of where I, I kind of start out at. And this night, um, I felt Sims was somewhere he shouldn't have been. I felt Sims was in a church that was closed after hours, intoxicated, driving around, and he was not where he should have been that night. Goldsmith, on the other hand, was dispatched there. This wasn't a case where he's out looking for somebody. This is a case where he was dispatched. That's called a call for service as opposed to an officer initiated. He was called to be out there. So Goldsmith was where he was supposed to be. My belief is Sims was not where he was supposed to be when this all first got started. Uh, then reviewing everything um, as Goldsmith approached the video or approached the car, you can see in his body camera video that uh, he notices a empty pistol holster in the front seat of the car. Now there's, you know, a reasonable officer would believe that there is a gun in play. We don't know where it's at. Um, that's definitely going to raise your, uh, uh, your, your officer safety awareness up there. So as he approached, come around, he's thinking there's still a gun in there. Uh, at that point, he got, he got pretty rough. And, and I'll tell you something about 
use of force is not a glamorous art form. It's ugly. It is ugly. And there's no, there's no beautiful way of making something like that. When someone doesn't comply, when someone resists, there's going to be force used, and it's never a, it's never a beautiful thing. No, there's a point there where uh, interaction occurs between them, correct? Yes. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to cut you off for just a moment, and I'm going to show you uh, got two videos. So these are going to be from our states. Is that popping up on there? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, this is from states uh, to your yeah. But I'm sure you're right. Is this the combo video? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> this is a combination video. So okay. take a look at this and then we'll have a conversation. So a moment ago you mentioned that um, use, use of force isn't always pretty. <clears throat> and so the situation that if, you know you observe there was interaction. Um, as you said, there was a basis uh, in your mind for what that interaction was. Um, Mr. Sims was knocked to the ground at some point in time. Did you see the cuffs were applied? Yes. All right. So after uh, cuffs were applied, was there a point in time that you learned something about Mr. Sims' is, uh, you know, is about what happened to him when he hit the ground? <clears throat> I mean, he was, he was knocked unconscious. So if knocked unconscious, uh, what should, excuse me, strike that please. Um, how, how, are you, uh, how are you taught if a person's not unconscious to, uh, to act for you? Yeah, well, anytime somebody's injured, you're gonna render aid. That's your, that's your priority. Uh, once you take somebody into custody, put handcuffs on them, it's just like adopting a child. It's your responsibility from that point on, his safety. You're not gonna leave him out in the road, get hit by a car. You're not gonna lay him down in an ant bed or something. You're going to, uh, he's just became your responsibility at that point. You've taken him into custody, you're responsible for him, his well-being, his health, and, uh, and in this case here, he was knocked unconscious. Uh, I, he never should have left him. He should have been rendered immediately. So hold on one for me. Let's show I mean, deputies are not doctors. They're not going to know exactly what to do in every situation, but you're going to do the best you can with the training you do have. And uh, Everybody's taught the recovery position, which is up on your side, and I think they've talked about it earlier in, in testimony, but uh, that's at minimum you do, and then immediately call for an ambulance because it's, it's beyond the scope of what you've been trained to handle. So why um, is AIDS, why, why is that what you're taught to immediately it, well, I mean, if a person's unconscious, I mean, it, it, it's, again, you just take them in your, your possession. You're, you're responsible for that person. As soon as you take them in custody, put handcuffs on them, you're responsible for them. Being unconscious is, that's a pretty serious matter. That doesn't, that's not everyday police work. That doesn't happen often. I can think of, uh, it, it doesn't happen very often if someone gets knocked out. That's enough. Can it happen? Yes, we've seen it happen in this incident here, but that's, that's a very serious uh, situation. And outside of um, there being an active threat going on around him, then you, you pretty much need to stop what you're doing. That's your priority is to make sure that he, he's okay. So rendering aid, is that part of due consideration? Absolutely. So as <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Sims is knocked unconscious, you, uh, witness Deputy Goldsmith walking away in that video? Yes. Uh, you mentioned just a moment ago uh, that there's a concern of some sort of you know, safety concern, things of that nature. Yes. So let's speak a little bit about that. Well, I know when the call first come in, um, I, the call, I'm trying to remember how the call came in originally, but I think it was multiple people reported that was out and uh, he was responding to it. So when he first arrived, he's only seeing one person. 
possibility. But, but the moment that the handcuffs were put on uh, and he got up and turned his back, then that kind of let me see that he, he didn't feel there was any other threat out there. Why is that? Well, because if there was another threat out there, then he would have he would have maintained a defensive posture and. Okay. Uh, I think you would have uh, stayed in your defensive mode, and you would have uh, scanned the area, making sure there wasn't anything else out there, and uh, kind of held your position, maybe call for backup or something. So it's interesting you just said that. Um, was his radio working? Yes, it appeared to be working on, on the video. And um, did you hear the portion where there was a question about backup? He said, no, he's taking a nap, or no, he's unconscious? Yes. What is, so that means he denied backup? Yes. When, what do you teach in the situation if there's a belief of an active threat? What is it yeah. Well, I mean, you're going to, your issued weapons that you have on you, but uh, in a situation where you feel that you're outnumbered or uh, there's going to be some more problems, then of course you're going you're gonna to call for backup. In this case here, not only was backup not called, it was turned down when it was offered. Taking a nap. What does that mean? I, I assume that's meaning he, he was unconscious. Is that a term that, uh, that, you, that you use? No, absolutely not. And so would you say that the, based on your training over 30 years in law enforcement, multiple agencies, including SLED and the Sheriff of Kershaw County, were Mr. Goldsmith's actions consistent with what's taught in this situation? No, we don't, we don't train anything like that. Is it consistent with how aid should be rendered? No, absolutely not. If you want me to go further into it, I mean, what I, what I saw when I was reviewing this here was uh, once the handcuffs went on, um, I really, I'd have a hard time trying to defend anything after that point. Uh, once the handcuffs was on, he turned his back, he walked away from him on the ground. Uh, I heard talk of the radio working or not, and, and you hear the beep, on the camera, that's when, you, when you're pushing the button, if it beeps, that means you, you've got a connection, you can talk. I don't know from the video whether he was trying to, and it wasn't beeping, which meant his radio wasn't working at the location, but when he got to where the, you did hear the beep, his radio was working, he was transmitting, he done three different things prior to calling EMS. One was he, um, you know, he made the, made the comment about him taking a nap. He turned down backup that was offered to him, and then he went back to the vehicle and started running the tag to process a, or to start working a DUI investigation. So is that what 1055 is a DUI? Yes. Um, to your knowledge, did Deputy Goldsmith ever see Tony Sims driving the vehicle? Your Honor, I object to this. <clears throat> Let's see
Thank you, Dr. <coughs> and so you said uh, three things concerned you. One was the failure to render aid. Um, the second was that I am walking away. And the uh, third was you know, trying to get back on the situation. The third, you said conducting this investigation. This is you this DUI investigation? <coughs> well, I, <coughs> I didn't really necessarily. It, it was three things that were done before EMS was contacted um, that I felt that should have been priority. EMS should have been contacted first, uh, but instead those three things were done outside of that when he did have radio transmission. So then, uh, let's go further out. So please observe this clip and we'll talk about this. Again, my, my thought process, uh, once he was handcuffed, he walked away, you know, the incident's kind of under control. You felt comfortable enough with the situation to turn your back and walk away from the situation was under control. When you go back up to him to get him back up at that point to put in your car, I'm fine with that as long as he's willing to get in the car. But when you know an ambulance is on the way, there's no need at that point of forcing him inside of the back of the car. You could have just left him there on the ground. So uh, that goes back to what I said earlier about not being able to defend any action after the handcuffs is, is really no, no more force could, should have been used after that point. And the procedure that you, do you teach um, that type of procedure? Um, and do you, uh, is that what you teach? The way that Deputy Goldsmith handled that procedure was he used the state in that situation? No, that's, that's. Uh, is that because of you know, handcuffs behind the back, the control that you mentioned? Yeah, I mean, to say someone just handcuffed is not a threat, that's not something I'm going to do. I mean, somebody just cuffed behind their back can still pose a threat to you. Generally, it's, they're a whole lot less of a threat to you once you get the handcuffs on, especially if it's to the point to where you felt comfortable enough to turn your back on them, then they're not much of a threat to you. Uh, true, he was unconscious at that point, and when he regained consciousness, now you, you're stepping things up. But I think when he picked him up and he fell down going back to the car, I don't have a problem with him picking him up, trying to take him to the car, put him in the car to where he's more comfortable. He's off the ground. He's not down. I mean, it could be ants on the ground, uh, asphalt. could be. I don't, I don't know what the conditions, but to, to help him up, to sit him in the car, I'm fine with that if he's willing to go. But to use force to put him in the car, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't go with that. Let me ask this question. Uh, at some point, EMS was called? Yes. All right. And um, is, that, is that the normal thing that happens if a person's knocked out? No, absolutely. I mean, you, you want to call EMS uh, anytime somebody's injured. It doesn't even have to get up to the point of them being knocked out. But if they're injured, again, this is, he's your responsibility. You take him into custody, he's your responsibility. The jail's not going to take him injured. Um, so, so he was going to EMS and he was going to go to the hospital? Yes, yes, you're gonna uh, you're gonna call EMS to take care of them, and we we don't we don't tell EMS what to do when they get there. They're the medical professionals. They're gonna assess what's going on, and they're gonna make a decision whether he needs to go to the hospital or if they can treat him on the scene. And we don't we don't influence that at all. And so, in that situation, knowing that EMS is coming, this man has been knocked unconscious, and we learned he's not deep knocked out, his jaw broken. You just said the jail's not going to accept them in that condition. Why is that? Because no, they're injured. The jail knows they need medical attention also. So 
So what's the rush of putting just to send them back to the car if the MS has got to come and check them out? There, there's no rush. There's no rush at all. That's just what, uh, you know, I felt that I have no problem with him trying to help him up to sit him in the car where it may be more comfortable than laying on the ground. Uh, but when he fell over and, and, and was not really wanting to comply or whether he was, you know, very uh, unsure of his footing and, and fell down, whatever the case may be at that point, it was, you were going to have to use force to get him from where he was at to the car. And that, that, that juice wasn't worth the squeeze. Yeah, that was what I, was, I mean, when he fell, uh, Goldsmith says something about what else you want me to do. That kind of leads me to believe that, you know, Goldsmith was trying to help him up, trying to get him in the car, and, and was starting to get frustrated because he wouldn't, wouldn't cooperate with him and it wasn't going as he wanted to. So that's when the frustration kicked in. That's when. Sustain. Can't speculate. <clears throat> so, based on uh, the policies that we talked about, uh, you just want. What is it that you want from an officer at that point? Well, I mean, at that point, once you knew that, that force was going to be necessary to get him somewhere he didn't have to be, then you, you didn't have to use the force. So I'm going to show you uh, from stage number 19, just to uh, clear. There's a word for it. Is that something you teach? No. Can you tell what he did there? Well, it appeared that he was trying to get Mr. Sims' feet in the car, and uh, but his feet came back out. Before. I don't think that, it, to me, it didn't look like he put his foot in the door and slammed it on it, but he did know the foot was in the door as he's shutting. Well, I, I saw Mr. Sims' foot come out. I saw the door getting pushed to and uh, wouldn't go all the way, and then force being placed on the door to try to get it to go, to try to get it to close. And is that a technique you use? No. Is that a technique you're taught? No. Right. <clears throat> Does that 
what you just saw in that video um, comport with how you train your officers? No. Um, talk to the jury a little bit about what double locking cuffs means. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I think it was a demonstration earlier, but uh, when I you keep objecting, but this is redundant testimony. Overruled. When you put the handcuffs on someone and you, you click them into place, uh, you double lock them for two reasons. It makes it harder for somebody to pick the handcuffs and the more important part is it keeps them getting tighter. Handcuffs are, uh, and even through the academy, it's always been trained that that's one of the biggest liabilities on hurting people's wrists because you're putting a very hard object on somebody's wrist and there's a lot, it's a pretty uh, tender area there. So you wanna make sure you double lock the handcuffs in order to keep them from getting tighter as uh, somebody moves around. And so if they're not double locked, place by someone's car in there, in the car, on them, what tends to happen to those hands? Yeah, they, they can get tighter. They're not gonna get looser. The way they're, they're set up, they're not designed to ever get looser. Than, but when they, 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 they can get tighter, if they're not double locked and any pressure is applied to uh, push them together. Uh, it feels pretty bad. Let's talk about de-escalation. Uh, can you tell the jury what de-escalation is? Well, uh, de-escalation is when uh, when the force levels up and, and, and you want to bring it down. You want to try to say or do something that's going to calm a situation down and maybe take a step back, take a breath. Hey, just, just calm down. Let's, let's settle down here and just do whatever. There's a lot of different techniques, but basically de-escalation is trying to... Um, you don't have to object again, then now we're going down the road. What, uh, what else could they do? Jeez, the sheriff, they've talked about what they teach and how they teach it. He's talking about what he teaches you. Okay, he can talk about something that they're using as their policies and procedures. I love that. And de-escalation is something that is something that uh, is taught at the academy. Yes, yes. It's something that you uh, teach as well and you encourage. Absolutely. So ultimately, uh, at the end of the day, after reviewing all of these matters, um, there were decisions that you had to make uh, regarding Mr. Goldsmith. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Let's talk about the decisions. Tell us what you did. I mean, he was terminated uh, at the point to, like I, I talked earlier, uh, the, the main thing I saw was the point where handcuffs were on and there was still, uh, yeah, I, I just, I can't defend anything after the original handcuff. Maybe picking him up and him falling back down, trying to get him to a car or something, but after that, I just, uh, just wasn't there. So it, no aid was rendered, and then you were using force that wasn't necessary because you were trying to your objective was to get him in the car that I just didn't feel was necessary at that point. Based on, and you terminated him based on the totality of what you saw in that day. What's the objective legally not sustained? Based on the totality of what you saw in that video, um, for your actions, you did what you felt was right? Yes, he was terminated. Courts of Dolphins? Yes, sir. Please answer your questions, Mr. Matthews. Ross, do you have any? Thank you. Do you know what the call was when uh, they dispatched Officer Wilson? From what I remember, it was multiple people in the parking lot, uh, just some suspicious activity. Right. Did you see the video of things that happened before he got there? Yes. Is that, is it, was that a domestic violence situation? Object to uh, best violence is with the characterization. Yeah, I, I really. Uh, over. Did you see the man and woman fighting? Yeah, I, I never knew it was a man and woman. I knew it was two people in there, but I did see the fighting, yes, sir. So there's a physical brawl going on out there before you got there. Yes, sir. All right, so when you're dispatched to a situation and they say there's multiple people or there's a possibility of multiple people, um, you never know what's going on. Absolutely not. It could be pretty bad. Right. And, and you expect your deputies to bear that in mind, don't you? Absolutely. All right. And when someone's laying on the ground there, 
you said he never should have walked away from him, but then you said he should have made sure, canvas the scene, and make sure there was no one else present, right? If he felt a threat was out there, yes, sir. So would it have been appropriate for him to walk around that church with that man laying on the ground? No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that would be appropriate. And y'all, are you aware of where there are or not uh, radio um, service problems in that area? Yeah, there are there are radio problems out there. I mean, I've personally witnessed uh, radios not working. It's it's a very rural part of the county, and uh, service can be an issue at that time. Right. That you, know, do you know how many deputies you had on patrol at night in the entire county? Probably six or seven. In the entire county. Yes. Do you know how, that's a very that's the extreme northern part of the county. Yes. All right. Do you know how many deputies on patrol that night up in that area? I, in that area, it was, it was probably just just Goldsmith. All right. is, is, is that a budgetary mm -hmm. issue, or, do you, or yes, sir, it's budget. It'd be nice to have mobilized. Oh, absolutely. And then when a call like this comes in, you've got supervisors, and their primary concern, their primary goal is to monitor what's going on in the county. Right? Yes. Right. Now they they respond to calls, especially if it's an urgent matter that they need to attend to. Yes. All right. And if they get a call or if they hear on the radio that there's been some use of force, their duty is to go there, right? Yes. And all that means no. Yes. Right. Well, let me show you Stakes Exhibit 13. What is that document? This, this is like our use of force policy. All right. And um, you've talked about the oath of office. You've talked about the philosophy of the, of the sheriff's department. Yes. You've talked about this already, I guess. Um, the mission statement. Yes. Is that document, the use of force policy, meant to be consistent with these policies? Yeah, you would hope so. That would be your intent, correct? Yes. Right. You issued the taser. Yes. You issued the pistol. Yes. You issued the pepper spray. Yes, sir. All right. And you're aware that under that use of force policy, which is based on Graham versus Cotton, right? Yes, sir. All right. You're aware that an officer is supposed to use the use of force in the situation based on his perception and what he knows under the circumstances, then and there for Beckham, right? Yeah, I mean, it's what a reasonable person would, or what a reasonable officer would think in that situation, right. and based off of what they're they're taking in at that time. Given what he knows, or given what he has been led to believe about the situation. Yes. Taking all this into consideration, taking how far away he is from Central, taking how far he is away from someone else arriving, uh, possibility or probability of other people in the neighborhood. If there's another car involved, that car can show up at any time. He doesn't, it, it, whether he knows somebody's in that car or not. Come on, question, I'm just ask me to break it down to the question. Too much. Break it down. All right, does the answer to any of those questions now? I just ask okay. you to ask the question, that's fine. All right. So taking into consideration whether he knows or not there's someone else present? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think everything you've listed there, yeah, absolutely, there's, there's a considerations a deputy should take in. And when you say that a pistol is a, ma a matter of concern, the possibility of a pistol, absolutely. that's like one of the biggest red flags there is. Oh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're looking at deadly force. Yeah, and they don't get much worse than that. Um, and uh, the fact that there's an objective reason to believe that there is a pistol present, but you don't know where that pistol is, that's even worse, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Where, where can a pistol be in a car? It could be anywhere. Anywhere. Where can the pistol be on a seat? Anywhere. Under the car? Under the car. Under on the side of the parking lot? Yes. Anywhere. Right. Um, so all those things would be in a deputy's mind. No, absolutely. And there are certainly situations in which a deputy should put someone in the back of the car for security reasons while he canvasses whether or not there's a continuing danger, right? Yes. And when he does that, there it's, it's a proper use of force to force him into the back of that car, correct? Yeah, yes, I mean, if you if you have the need to put him in the back of the car, and, and then yes, force can be used. So he's standing out there, and you're just letting him stand there, and 
and somebody else pulls up, or somebody comes out from behind that church, or somebody gets out of that car, you got a problem, don't you? Yes. All right. And you talked about what you could see him doing with his feet on that video, but that's from the perspective of an infrared camera from a church at an elevated position, correct? Yes. You can't see what he's doing on that body cam portion of the video, can you? No, no, I mean the body cam. Yeah, I mean the body camera is just, it's right on their chest. Yeah. So when you get up close on things, then yeah, I mean you're what you now the body camera is kind of a if you use the word fish eye view where you've got a it's a wider view than you can see. It's not like a little telescope or something. So you can see a good bit of what's going on, but your body camera is not going to tell you what the deputy is looking at. Exactly, and, uh, and, and in the same way, it's, it, from a distance you can see a foot hanging out of the bottom of the car. The deputy with that body cam here looking in look like this can't necessarily see that can no, no especially in a darkened situation like this church parking lot you testified about what you expected your officers to, to do under these various policies you also expect them to control situations don't you yeah, absolutely right. you expect them to enforce the law Yes, sir. You expect them to use such force as reasonable under the circumstances? Yes, sir. And as you said, use of force can be ugly, can it? Absolutely. Just an afterthought. Let me show you this picture. This is State's Exhibit 8, I'm sorry. You see any taser marks on that picture? What appear to be taser marks? Uh, yeah, I mean, if I had to guess, I would say uh, right. Sure. Are you familiar with taser marks? Yeah, I have seen taser marks. Are you taser not, certified? Yeah. Uh, not at this time. Not. It's expired on me. But uh, do you have I'm familiar with? Yes. Sir. All right. So, in your opinion, are there taser marks in that picture? Objective opinion. You can testify. Yeah. I, I see marks. On the on the shoulder area here that, that are consistent with uh, pressing anything into somebody. Um, that's that's what it appears to me, just in my my opinion. All right, and just to be sure, you're you're, you're pointing here. Yes, sir. Not up here on the side of the mat. Yes, sir. Very good. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and, and you're taking the totality of the circumstances into consideration, such as he's laying in there in handcuffs, I've got to get service, I've got to call this problem in, I've got to call an EMS. He should walk away until he gets service, right? Yeah, I mean, if he doesn't have service where he's standing at, then absolutely. That's, that's your priority is to, to get service, you can call it EMS. They're going to be better able to uh, take care of the person you just took into custody than you are, because we don't, you know, they're not doctors, they're not EMTs or anything. And he goes back and, 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 he, and he immediately says, hey, you all right? Did you, did you hear that? I heard him, I, uh, the immediate word there, we may disagree on, but I did hear him uh, ask him if he's all right. All right. And, uh, and, 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 and in that same vein, in the, as he's trying to get him into the back of the car, he's, he, I mean, he's, he's forceful. He's going, get in the car, get in the car, slide in, slide in. Now, that's not necessarily evidence of anger towards the person. That's firmness, correct? I, you know, I, I can't comment on how he Officers was feeling. Very and, firm with people in these yes, it was firm. You could definitely hear. I think anybody anywhere in that neighborhood could have heard the commands for him to get in the car. And it's appropriate to make your man commands crystal clear, isn't it? You want them to be crystal clear. Very good. Um, did he ever comply with those commands? 
I didn't see a whole lot of compliance there. Sitting in the back of a patrol car with your, with your hands handcuffed behind your back, then you're, it, 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 to your knowledge, is a very uncomfortable situation. Uh, yeah, I mean, handcuffs aren't built for comfort. Right, and, and people whine and cry about it all the time. My wrist hurt, my wrist hurt, don't they? And they absolutely do. Yeah. That's part of the ugly part. Oh, yes. This case made the press, didn't it? It did. So I think you. Uh, I think it was about three weeks before it was terminated. But sounds about right. And you said you knew it beforehand. Yes. Did, did, did you invite him to, to apply? I can't remember. I may have. I may have. He. I mean, he was, he was a good officer. Yeah. And and I think he was like. Was he, was he your first time? I don't know if he was among the first. I want to say maybe the first month I was in office there. Of course, he's on the phone. Yes, sir. That's all I have, right? Automatically sent to a scene when a person is knocked out. Or, or I, well, I would hope that if they had, if they heard it over the radio, they would respond to see what's going on. Because I mean, they are responsible for everybody on the ship. But are they automatically to immediately go out? I yeah, I don't know that there's a policy. I mean, a, a requirement. I've never I've never fired a supervisor uh, if they didn't respond to it. It's kind of a I don't know, they may be on another call, they might not be immediately available to run out there. So a lot of times when we have multiple calls going on at one time and, and the guys are spread pretty thin, so I mean, this, I'm not gonna fire a supervisor if he doesn't uh, immediately respond, but I would like to think that if they were available, then you, you're gonna wanna know what's going on with somebody on your ship. So what does it mean if somebody says, I don't need backup? Yeah. Uh, that means they, they feel like they got the situation under control and they don't need any, any other officers there. What does it mean when a person walks away with their back to the scene? I, I, I take it as them, they're, they're turning their back on any possible threat, so they don't feel there is a threat. <clears throat> was there a gun found in the situation? None that I know of. I don't think a gun was located uh, this incident. There's been uh, some speculation about whether the radio working and how far away it worked. When calls were made, people responded, correct? Yes. And when this man, Tony Sims, was knocked out, lying on the ground in cuffs, was raised, excuse me, was aid rendered immediately? No, sir. What is one talk? What is one talk to do in this situation? Well, I know you, you've heard the recovery position. That's just very bare minimum recovery position and then call EMS because you know you're not, you're not trained to handle something like that, but you are responsible for that. Uh, that, that. And their recovery because you don't want them to choke on their blood or teeth or something like that, right? Yes. Now, there's a question again about the double cuff and cuff. Cuffs hurt when you put handcuffs on. Yes. And people complain when they're, when they're not cuffed. Yes. But there are less fewer complaints when they're double cuffed. Yes. And there's a question that's about the, the camera, you know, just the body camera and what you can see, what you can't see. Um, but. You can clearly hear in this video screaming, you're slamming my foot in the door. 
Uh, yeah, I think I think anyone in the neighborhood could have heard the commands. Anyone in the neighborhood could have heard the yelling, uh, and the door was not closing. Um, and it was yes. being pushed by whom? Goldsmith. That's something that you teach. No, sir. That's all I have. All right, follow up. In fact, the supervisor did respond. In fact, the supervisor did respond. Yes, sir, he did. In a time. Yes, sir. The fact that the gun wasn't found later, does that change the officer's calculus of the situation at all? Absolutely not. I would think if a gun was found, it may have stepped down everything because now you know where it's at, but not knowing where it's at the whole time is still you know, up in the air. <coughs> Even though the gun ultimately was never found, does that change the calculus in any way? I mean, no. I mean, you, the officer, no. From a time, the I'm sorry. As far as the officer's response, yeah, I would say since he saw the empty holster and didn't know where the gun was at, it was never found. So you, you still got an unknown location of a gun the whole time you're there. And, and, but what I'm trying to say is, even after they searched the car after everything was under control. And found that doesn't change anything. No. Do you know whether or not he was in the recovery position on the ground? From the video, do you have any idea whether or not Mr. Simpson was in the recovery position? It, it's hard to say in the video. It's kind of, and I watched it again, and it, it's, it's, I mean, it looks like he was on his back, and sometimes it looks like he might have been on his side. It's just a, it's a hard call there. I mean, y'all saw the same video I saw. Very good. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, Sheriff. Let me step down, sir. All right. And the state may call their next witness.